everyone uh, welcome to the european non associated press seminar today is october 2 2023 and we have a talk by also again Sibanda from mindanao state state university of the philippines and she's going to talk on fine and graded classification conjecture for limit path algebra please thank you Mikola, and um thank you for the invitation it's uh, such an honor to be invited in such a prestigious uh, webinar and i really appreciate it all right so good evening from the philippines and i think it's afternoon now in in europe if i'm not mistaken and morning in in, in the US or in, in America. And as what uh, Mikola said, my presentation is entitled Finite Graded Classification Conjecture for Levit Path Algebras. And um, the original results that you will find in this presentation is going to be a compilation of results from these papers that you find here, found in the, I think, this three in the bottom and the the other two are if you're interested you can check them out <laughs> with my uh, supervisor in my phd uh, in the philippines uh, at msuit dr jocelyn velela my external supervisor in western sydney university in australia dr rusby hazrat a uh, collaborator from germany but now he's in sweden dr wolfgang bock and some of my other collaborators from spain all right. So the focal point of my research is on directed graphs. So basically you have vertices and edges with orientation and two algebraic entities that you can obtain using a directed graph. One is called the Levit path algebra and the other one is called talented monoid. So might one might wonder why it's called talented monoid is it really talent and if it's yeah if it's yeah if yes then what are the talents of this monoid um levit path algebra came um in the world of mathematics around 2005 or 6 or 7 um with these two papers which are independent of each other but are like more or less uh the same time that was created and the talented monoid came first uh, in 2013 with a paper of Hazrat, my supervisor in Australia. But at this time, it was not yet called talented monoid. As a matter of fact, the form that of the of this monoid, where of the form which we can see it today, it's not yet that form at the time. It was disguised as a monoid related to the Levit path algebra. But not until the paper of Hazrat and Lee in 2020, where it was formally called the Talented Monarch. And the graded classification conjecture for finite graphs actually says that we can classify the Talented Monoid uh, in terms of classification in the Levit path algebra side. In particular, in the talented monoid side, we are our classification in, is based on what we call Z isomorphism of talented monoids. On the other hand, we are going to look at the graded equivalence of categories of graded modules over the Levit path algebra. And if this conjecture is indeed true, then naturally we might expect that something that is true in one should correspond to something that's also true on the other. And if this property is shared between this uh, monoid and this Levit path algebra, of course, not necessarily the same property, but um, an, uh, a counterpart of the property rather, then it will serve as an evidence of the graded classification conjecture. And in this talk, we will see an evidence to this conjecture and as what the title of my talk also says, we will also see a finite version of this conjecture and we are gonna see a confirmation of, yeah, a confirmation of the finite version of this conjecture, which means that in terms of 
these modules that we see here, we are gonna look at those finite graded, um, finite dimensional graded modules over the Levick path algebra. Now, good um, news for me and many others who are trying to prove the conjecture. It was proven through to a certain type of graph, which we call, uh, Rusbe called the policy folly graphs. Well, I'm not sure actually if it was Rusbe who coined this term, but <laughs> it was called policy folly graphs because of, um, if you can imagine the policy folly creatures, you have uh, one body with multiple heads. And just imagine a graph where in every path, maybe I should write, of course, because I can write. In every path, it's either leading to a cycle or to a sink. A sink means that it's not emitting anything. And, uh, well, playfully, it looks like a polycephaly creature. <laughs> that's why it's called polycephaly graphs. So that's good news for us was trying to prove the conjecture because now at least we are we know that there's a certain type of graphs out there that is actually satisfying this conjecture. Okay. But how did the study of Levitt path algebra started? It started with the invariant basis number property, which basically says for a ring that all finitely generated modules over that ring is actually a finite rank, or not finite rank, but well-defined rank. And Levitt, in the 1960s, he was interested in those algebras that are actually not satisfying the invariant basis number property. Um, in particular, let's say L is this algebra and L to the N is isomorphic to L. So it's not satisfying the um, uniqueness of um, the rank. Now, it was proved in 2005 that this particular algebra, which is not satisfying the invariant basis number property, is actually the Levitt path algebra of a graph which contains one vertex and n loops. And since then, um, researchers are done <laughs> in uh, trying to know more about the structure about of the Levitt path algebra. But before I dig into math so much, uh, let, I will first share about uh, um, a story. Yeah, I think it's a story of a mad veterinarian. So this veterinarian is very smart. He's a genius, but he's also crazy <laughs> because he's working with... Um, animals. In this case, he's working with a beaver, a cat, and an ant. Now, this mad genius veterinarian has created a, or had created a machine, and it does some magical things with the animals. What it does is if he puts an ant inside the, uh, the machine, yeah, it produced another animal. In this case, the ant became a beaver. Now, if the veterinarian puts a beaver inside the machine, it then produced an ant, a beaver, and a cat. So it seems like the machine does not just change the, um, the type of animal, but it's also producing more animals. And lastly, if, it put, if the veterinarian puts one cat, then it produces one ant and one beaver. All right, let's say the machine also works in the reverse way, which means that if the bit mad veterinarian puts these animals inside of the machine, then it produces the animal on, on, on the left-hand side, which means that if it puts, if he put, um, if he puts these three animals, then it produces one beaver. He's now wondering, or the mad veterinarian is now wondering, is it possible to produce two cats if the he uses the machine over and over and over again? I don't know how many times, but yeah, he, is it possible to, to obtain two cats using initially having one ant? Well, we can try by using the machine. 
Well, if we put the cat inside, it produced a beaver. And the beaver produced one ant, one cat, and one beaver. And yeah, one beaver. And if we just keep the cat, we don't use the machine again, then we just put the beaver and the ant inside, then it will produce another cat. So to answer um, the question, yes. But this seems to be a very tedious task to just, I don't know, shoot your shot in trying to put the combinations of animals inside of your machine and just hope for the best that you will actually obtain the animals. Now, is there a more, is there an easier way to do this process? Let's try if there's a way. Hopefully there's a way. And all right, let's say the transformation from one animal to the other is represented by an arrow or a directed edge. So that rep uh, transformation is represented by this arrow. So as you would already expect and hope, then this entire scheme is represented by this directed graph where the vertices are actually representing the animals and the arrows are representing the transformation of animals. But let's use a mathematical tool since we have already a directed graph. And in this case, we are going to use the so-called graph monoid. It is defined for a row finite graph. By row finite, we just mean that every vertex is emitting a finite number of edges. A uh, graph monoid is an abelian monoid generated by your set of vertices where you just equate every vertex to all of the other vertices that it is emitting. Of course, it should not be a sink. When we say it's not a sink, then it's emitting something. And in 2010, Abrams and Sklar actually utilized the graph monoid with the mad veterinarian problem with have uh, having this graph here. So as you see here, uh, for example, A is equal to B because A is just emitting one edge, which goes to B. And B is equal to A plus B plus C because it's emitting the, those respective vertices. Therefore, the calculation, the transformation that we did earlier is actually just a very simple um, calculation in the graph monoid, which gives us A representing ant equaling to 2C representing two cats. In 20, 2007, it was proved that this graph monoid is actually the monoid of finitely generated projective modules over the Levitt path algebra under um, by taking direct sums. Okay, but this is not yet the talented monoid that I was referring to earlier. So let's see what additional thing we should add. Probably, yeah, we should add in this monoid to make it talented. All right. In 2019, um, Hazrat and Lee actually modified this um, puzzle as follows. So let's say you your transformation is the same, but this time there is an age as one of the components in the in the picture. Let's say the beaver is age 10, uh, n, then in putting inside the machine, those animals are actually aging one unit. So now the question is, how old are these animals then? Because we know already that it's possible to produce two cats, but how old are they? In this case, we are going to use, oh, sorry. Okay. In this case, we are going to use the so-called talented monoid. It's basically more or less the same. Um, it's an abelian monoid now generated by the set containing B of I for every vertex and integer I. And it's the same. We're just equating every vertex to all of the vertices that it is emitting. But this time, since we are now indexed by the set of integers, we are actually adding one to the index every time we are using the relation. 
Okay, and it and it looks pretty much the same with the talent or sorry the graph monoid, but okay, I don't think I put it in in my slides, but one might wonder: is there a graph that actually has talented monoid? Yeah, is there a graph with a graph monoid? Um, okay, <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but let's say I have a graph here. Then if we take the so-called um, covering graph, which I will not define here, then the graph monoid M sub E bar of this graph is actually just your talented monoid. So we see that there's such graphs. And in comparison to the fact that the graph monoid is the monoid of finitely generated projective modules over your Levit path algebra, in 2018, it was proved that the talented monoid is actually the monoid of graded finitely generated projective modules over the Levit path algebra. So the grading here is, of course, based on um, the um, the set of integers because we we actually was um, using the set of integers earlier in the definition of a talented monoid. And about the ages of the animals. If we put an ant with one which is one year old using your talented monoid relations, then what we obtain is a, um, what we obtain are two cats, one which is two years old and the other is three years old. But now, and, uh, many, many things need, needed to wonder. <laughs> one of them is that Okay, maybe the talented monoid and the graph monoid are just ex um, essentially the same, which means that it's really not important to add a dis additional problem <laughs> given by the set of integers. It's just um, giving us additional things to consider. But actually, if we look at these two graphs, E and F, which are, of course, not the same, but their graph monoids are actually isomorphic but their talented monoids are not isomorphic. So this tells us that the talented monoid is more or less more successful in classifying our graphs. Now, also with our graded classification conjecture is that, that the hope is that it's also more successful in classifying um, the graded modules over your Levitt path algebra. The set of integers is acting actually on the talented monoid via um, shifting of indices, or this is what we see here. And because of this, the talented monoid is a so-called Z monoid. Now for a general monoid and a general group gamma, such group or such monoids with an action from the group gamma on your monoid via monoid automorphisms is actually called a gamma monoid, of course. Now, um, of course, if you have groups, you have subgroups, if you have, I don't know, rings, you have subrings or ideals. Similarly, for the talented monoid, or let's just say for the Z monoid actually, uh, there's what we call the Z order ideal. These are simply submonoids which are isomorph, which are respecting the action of your Z and is hereditary in, in some sense. But equivalently, this we have this equivalent statement here. So what now, what's next? Why are we um, talking about Z order ideal and so on? It's because we will try to connect the graph, meaning we are trying to look at the geometry of the graph. We are now, and at the same time, trying to look at the talented monoid and the Levitt path algebra and see if there are some connections. In the, okay, as a matter of fact, in 2018, if we could have this so-called hereditary saturated sets or subset of vertices in your graph, they are actually generating the Z order ideals that we have um, previously defined. and. On the other hand, in 2017, um, the same set of vertices are actually generating the graded ideals of the Levitt path algebra. 
Therefore, um, it's enough to look at the hereditary saturated sets and we are also looking at these two ideals in both sides. So, as a, but what are these hereditary saturated sets? Um, it is a collection of vertices where if the source vertex is inside your set, then the range vertex should also be inside your um, set. So it's basically some like inheriting the property of being inside the set. It's called saturated if all of the vertices that is emitted by a vertex is in, are inside your set, then the source vertex should also be inside your set. As a quick example, we will see here that um, these two guys, these two sets are actually both hereditary and saturated, but this guy is not because, okay, let's try to look why. If we look at B, it's emitting one edge going to C and it's the only um, edge that it's emitting. So by saturatedness, it should be inside the set containing C if it, it, if it would have been saturated. But since it's not in this singleton set, then that set is not saturated. All right. Now let's see or let's take a look at this graph here. So I have a collection of um, cycles that is connected by a path or in this case by a single edge. So one cycle is directing to another cycle. If we collect this set of vertices here, then we can actually easily verify that this, this is both hereditary and saturated. So I have a set which is hereditary and saturated. It means that I can take its Z order ideal because such sets are generating those ideals. So I have this Z order ideal. If I can collect this additional set of vertices here, adding from H1, then again, it's both hereditary and saturated. So similarly, it's generating a Z-order ideal. So you know, it's, it's now easy to see the trend of the process where what happens is that we have a sequence of um, cycles in this case, and such sequence is now corresponding to a sequence of hereditary and saturated set and a sequence of Z order ideals. And finally, you have the entire thing. Of course, the entire set of vertices is both hereditary and saturated. All right, so since we have now, we have seen that um, we have found a sequence of Z order ideals. Actually, in the talented monoid side, in the property that we are going to look from talented monoid and Levitt path algebra, um, we are going to look at the so-called Z composition series, which already sounds familiar to all of us <laughs> um, specializing in algebra. But what is this? It's a talent, it's a, um, a series of, or a sequence of Z order ideals where each of the quotients are actually simple Z monoids, which is basically um, the same as the definition we always see. And if each of these um, simple monoids are of some type based on the comparability of their elements, then the entire Z composition series is also called that type. And it's also possible that the simple um, quotients are not of the same type, then it's we just call it a mixed type. Now, in we know that this the idea or the concept of composition series actually makes sense in group theory because it's well defined in 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 the sense that um it has the same length. That's that's actually the consequence of that. They have any composition series as the same length. The next question is that. Since I have defined, we have defined this um, concept in a similar sense, is it also true that this, this so-called Z composition series is unique in some way? 
which gives us a unique length. And to answer that, it's yes. Um, this is the adaptation of the Jordan-Hilder theorem, which is basically the theorem found in group theory, which basically basically says that any compos gamma composition series are equivalent and gamma monoid having a composition series determines a, a unique list of simple gamma monoids, which also then implies that for any composition series that we obtain, basically we have a unique length. Now you see here the term refinement. It's not actually true for all gamma monoids, but those monoids which are just a refinement. And one might wonder if, are there examples of gamma monoids which are not refinement anyways? By refinement, it just means that we can refine the any summation in a particular way. And to answer that, we have we have found this example of a non-refinement gamma monoid. So yeah, to answer, not all gamma monoids are refinement, which giving the um the term or the yeah the term refinement um some sense <laughs> and uh this the reason why um we need refinement is be actually because we need the concept of sum of z order ideals but in this particular example we can find two z order ideals which where their sum is not actually a z order ideal Okay, so now we know the talented monoid and the concept of Z composition series. The next question is, in the direction of trying to connect the talented monoid and the Levitt path algebra, what concept now should somehow correspond in, or not correspond, should we relate to that Z composition series in, in the Levitt path algebra side? But what first is a Levitt path algebra because I haven't <laughs> defined it yet. <laughs> okay, so, but before Levitt path algebra, what is a path algebra? If I have a graph E and a ring R with identity or possibly no identity, then the path algebra RE is actually an R algebra generated by your set of vertices and set of edges satisfying these two relations here. But what do they mean? It means that if I try to multiply a vertex by itself, I just obtain the same vertex. And if they are not the same, then I just send it to zero. And this tells us that the set of vertices is actually your orthogonal idempotence in your algebra. Now, if we try to multiply a um, vertex and an edge, somehow what happens is that there is some sort of absorption of vertex in some way. If this guy, which is located in the left, is the source of this edge, then it's absorbing it, giving us E. And similarly, if it's written on the right, if this vertex is the range this time, not the source, but the range, and it's because it's written in the right of this edge, then it's also absorbing that vertex. For example, what happens if we try now to multiply two, two edges? Basically, what would happen is that if we multiply two edges and we see that they are actually forming a longer path, maybe not longer, but it's forming a path, this path here, then, okay, I will just have a legitimate element, EF, which is a path. Okay, you're good to go. But... If we try to multiply two vertices, two edges, which are not actually connected in the correct um, way, then we will just send that to zero. And what we actually did in this entire thing is just con uh, the so-called concatenation of paths, which means that if you uh, try to multiply or concatenate two paths, and if it's um forming a new path then you're okay if it if it's not forming a new path then you just send it to zero now the levitt path algebra you again have a graph e and a ring r now the levitt path algebra 
is the path algebra over, not over the graph E, but over the double graph. So what first is a double graph? A double graph is basically adding what we call ghost edges in your graph. And these ghost edges are actually those edges with the opposite orientation, which means if I have an edge E here, then the ghost edge is the opposite orientation. Yeah, so it's just duplicating the number of edges with the opposite orientation. So it's, again, the Levitt path algebra is a path algebra over the double graph. Now, we will add two more relations. And these are, of course, should this relation should um, take care of your ghost edges because those are the additional edges that you have added. And these are the so-called Kuhn-Skrieger relations. Okay, so I will not dig deeper about those relations, but let's see for some fundamental examples of Levitt path algebra. If I have this graph E here, which is composed of one vertex and one loop, the path algebra of your E is actually your polynomial algebra, and your Levitt path algebra is your Laurent polynomial algebra. Now you see here that there is already some sort of connection of how these two algebras are. And on the other hand, if F is this guy, which is looking like a path in, in, the, in the usual sense, then the path algebra of that guy is actually the upper triangular n by n matrices over your field. And on the other hand, the Levitt path algebra of F over F is actually your entire matrix algebra. Okay, so now that we are now ready to, to um, answer the question, what is the concept now that we are going to take a look on the Levitt path algebra side in comparison or relating to the Z composition series in the talented monoid side? And this is what we call the gelfand kirillov dimension. Because remember, in the Z-composition series, we actually have a number which corresponds to the length of your composition series. Now, this gelfand kirillov dimension, is, of course, it's, it's, it has its name. It's a dimension. So we are also going to obtain some number in this, this side. The gelfand kirillov dimension has this quite of a lengthy definition. But basically, what it is, it's looking at a sequence of dimension of some subspaces which corresponds to um, span of products of certain length. Now, if we have this um, sequence of dimension, then the gelfand kirillov dimension is this formula that we find here. Now, to be honest, when I first saw this as a, as a graduate student, I was um, and a graduate student which is in algebra, I was kind of um, terrified. <laughs> but thankfully, Zelmanov, Alamadi, Al Sulami, and Hain have actually provided a wonderful uh, uh, formula for the Gelfand Kirillov dimension of the Levitt path algebra. Now, you don't need to dig deeper in the algebra of the Levitt path algebra, but you just need to see the dimension, not the dimension, but the, the geometry of the graph. In particular, you are going to take a look at uh, a length of chain of cycles in your graph. If you remember in the beginning of, uh, of my talk, you have this chain of cycles. And for example, Using the formula that they have provided, the gelfand kirillov dimension of the Levitt path algebra of this guy is actually 5. So that is a very good news because you don't have to, to, to think too much algebraically, but you just have to look at your, at your uh, graph, essentially. Now, um, since we are trying to connect the talented monoid and the gelfand kirillov dimension, um, we must see this gelfand kirillov dimension in the sense of talented monoid, of course. All right. So one of the main results that we have is that actually you can characterize the geometry of the graph, the 
um, monoid structure of the talented monoid and the algebraic structure of the Levitt path algebra in terms of the concepts that we have seen so far. First, the graph has um, has disjoint cycles. It means that every two cycles are not sharing the same vertex. Second, the talented monoid has a composition series of cyclic and uncomparable types. And lastly, the Levitt path algebra has a finite gelfand Kirillov dimension. So you see here in the first one, I'm just repeating myself, but in the first one, we are looking at the geometry of the graph. The second one, the monoid structure through the composition series. And last one, the algebraic structure through the gelfand kirillov dimension. Okay, so a natural question would be asked after this characterization is that, all right, um, you have now related the talented monoid composition series with the gelfand kirillov dimension. And Zelmanov and others have provided a wonderful formula for the gelfand kirillov dimension solely looking at the geometry of the graph. A uh, question would be, is there also a way to compute the gelfand kirillov dimension now looking at the talented monoid but not looking at the, at the geometry of the graph? And to answer that, yeah. So basically what this um, result tells us that if I have a talented monoid, then we can just look at some um, Z order ideals inside your talented monoid and look at the, um, the length of composition series of this particular um, Z order ideal. And there you go. You can now look find the um, gelfand kirillov dimension of your graph or of sorry of the Levitt path algebra of your graph. All right. So since we are we were I was talking about an evidence of the graded classification conjecture. We have one, and this basically says that if you have isomorphic talented monoids, then your gelfand kirillov dimension are actually the same. So in this side, this is a property we find in the talented monoid, of course, that they are isomorphic. And in this side, that their um, gelfand kirillov dimension being equal is a property we find in the Levitt path algebra side, which gives us an evidence of the graded classification conjecture. And finally, what's on and popping with the graded classification conjecture so far since it was um, formulated a decade ago in 2013, what we know so far in a future and a coming paper with Rosebe and Wolfgang, we have shown that this um, graded classification conjecture is actually true. In the case of finite dimension, meaning those this dimension of those um, well objects you find in this category is actually finite. And another variation of um, so that what it means the dimension of your um, graded module is finite. Another version is if the summons of this um, direct sum is actually finite, we have also proved that but for the meantime, for sinkless graphs. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much you know, for your support. Thank you. Is, is, there, is there any question?
I see a question, I have a question, maybe. Uh, do you have some, maybe, examples of monoids, some well-known classes of monoids that can be realized as the latent monoids or as graph monoids of some graphs, for example, let's say the monoid of, of positive, no, not, not, not negative integers, for example, can it be realized as a graph monoid or is it a light monoid of some graph? Oh yeah, I, I, I have already seen some examples of a talented monoid, but of um, which actually, is okay the talented monoid of a graph but actually it is a, a monoid by itself not based on a graph like independently it's a monoid itself and i, I i'm sorry but i cannot <laughs> i don't remember what it is exactly right now but yeah I, there are some monoids which are not entirely talented monoid but is realized as a talented monoid okay so as I see, for example, if, if the graph has finite number of vertices, the monoid can have can be infinite. Yes. I'm sorry, what? I mean, if the even if the graph has finitely many vertices, its monoid. If I if I, I mean I mean maybe I'm I'm confusing the definition. No, I can go back. Are you considering Yes. Yes, you are considering. Uh, ah, well, so it's 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 infinitely generated because it has i s, which which uh, runs to all the numbers. So even if you have a finite number of vertices, it's infinitely generated. Yep. And you have some infinite number of relations. So it may happen that this monoid is finite. I mean, even if, even though it's infinitely generated with infinitely many uh, relations, it can happen that it's finite. Well, a priori. Yep. I mean, I'm looking for some simple examples of such um, monoids. Oh. oh. Yeah, there is example. There is a related question in the chat. Is there a simple example of finite graphs such that the corresponding algebra is infinite dimensional? Um. Yeah, uh, for example, um, any graph with a cycle is actually infinite dimensional. Yes, yes. It's a matter of fact, one, um, one word and one side and one uh, page. Yes. For example, yeah. You mean? For example. Mm -hmm. Or any any length of a cycle because uh, the existence of a cycle is the deter it will determine if your graph or sorry if your algebra is infinite dimensional yes yes thank you for the question <laughs> we, we, yeah. any other question does the funny material material work with algebra um Sorry, I am not familiar with four algebras. Maybe I, I, if I understand the question, I mean, the how would it work? I mean, the Victorian the puts a cat or an animal inside his machine and it produces some pairs of, of, of animals or not pairs, but in order to, it's difficult to understand. It. <laughs> Maybe you could uh, you could specify a question for him. You, know, you can also talk if you wish. You can, you can uh, switch on your microphone. Yes, please. Oh, all right. 
So, does this simple example which you mentioned satisfy the conjecture or not to be here? Um, the, simple, which conjecture? Uh, the graded classification conjecture. Um, for now, we are not yet sure. <laughs> Even in the case of finite dimensional. Actually, um, the re if we go back to the last part uh, of my talk, we have proved a variation of the conjecture in the finite dimensional case where every summon is finite dimensional but only in the sinkless type. And actually, it's not the cycles that is making a mess in the story at at well at least to our study but it's it's the sinks that actually making the mess <laughs> because up until now we haven't proven a more general um case where you have any graph even with the sink even in this in this um restrictive case okay thank you maybe there's another question And I guess so. so thanks again for your talk. Thanks for giving it to me such a light. Thank you. So, so I will end also thanks for the participants and again. So see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Ivan, if you're there. And thank you, everyone.